in order to apply those principles and reconcile the, the inherent conflicts and make informed judgments about uh, ethical research. We need people who are investigators and research teams and IRB members and statisticians and ethicists, et cetera, who have this kind of information and can use this kind of a framework to make decisions. So hopefully all of you will be able to find it useful in whatever work you do. I want to end with just a minute or two about some interesting challenges that are going on that uh, people have cited as, um, you know, some of this I've already actually already referred to in terms of the NPRM and the proposal for changing the common rule. But cer certain ways that we do research now that were not envisioned when some of the uh, regulations and, and codes of ethics were written. And so people are beginning to question, are, do we have the right set of guidance in terms of um, doing research? I think the principles, the seven principles that I just described, are very useful in thinking through these new challenges in research. But for example, more and more of the research that's being done is multi-site and, and also multinational. So you have differences between sites, differences between countries that make very important challenges in terms of how to do something right that's also scientifically rigorous. And I've already mentioned the IRB challenges in terms of um, multiple sites. There's been a lot of attention in the last couple of years to <clears throat> learning healthcare systems, quality improvement research, comparative effectiveness research, some people call usual care research or standard of care research, and questions related to whether or not these all are similar to the sort of clinical trial paradigm that, that the rules and the regulations and the guidance has been, was written. Um, about. Um, and there are huge debates in the literature. Maybe some of you have heard about the support study that occurred a couple of years ago, and there's still people writing about the support study um, in, in terms of whether or not we have the right paradigm for thinking about research ethics. We're also in the middle of lots of debates about research using data and samples or biospecimens. Um, the uh, notice of proposed rulemaking, the NPRM, has some major changes in terms of how we do research with biospecimens and, and data uh, from how we currently do research with biospecimens and data. And so there are lots of discussions about whether or not the NPRM proposals are correct um, <clears throat> and how they're going to change how we do research. And certainly um, much attention in the last couple of years to genomic data collecting genomic data and sharing genomic data. And one of the other NIH policies that's very influential in terms of research is the genomic data sharing policy, which requires NIH-funded investigators to, that do genomic research to share their data and deposit it in a government repository. So there are lots of interesting challenges in these changing uh, landscapes. And this last slide is just a, a link to some more information that you might uh, find useful. So questions, comments, challenges? Nothing. Clear as mud. <laughs> For those of you who studied ethics in the past, did this add anything to your knowledge base or was it repetitious? <laughs> it added? Okay, at least one added. <laughs> Nobody has any questions? Any cases you want to raise? Things you've been wondering about? Did you have a question? Uh, what do you mean by benchmarking? Assessing their general overall whatever characteristics of what the study is addressing. Well, if I understand what you mean correctly, uh, most of the time, especially for studies that involve interventions, 
there's a pretty thorough history and physical done and a careful assessment of whether each individual meets the inclusion and criteria that are specified to protect people in that study. And then a series of data points at which different measurements are taken to see how the individual is or is not responding to the intervention, um, which includes not only you know, measures of efficacy, if you will, but also safety, you know, what kinds of toxicities, side effects, et cetera. So those are, in research, especially research with interventions, those are very carefully uh, monitored, those kinds of things. So is that what you meant, had in mind? Yeah. So that's a good question. So um, it is the nature of the beast that we don't know the full effects of things that we're trying in research, which is really why we're doing them, right? Why we're trying something and why we're why we are monitoring so closely and watching people. And almost every study that you might encounter has what they call stopping rules, which are both for individuals. If individuals experience this kind of side effect or, or this level of, har of side effect, they will be taken out of the study or their dose will be adjusted or, or uh, held for a while. And there are also stopping rules usually for the entire study. You know, if two people have this or four people have this kind of level of side effect, then the study will be changed or stopped or things like that. So there, those kinds of safeguards are built into studies all the time. However, there's another issue that I think you're raising, and that is, what if somebody is hurt? Um, and it, it is one of the more controversial areas in research ethics, I think, and that is that in the United States, anyway, we do not have a requirement for or a system for compensating people who are hurt in research, who are injured in research. Um, what we do have is a regulation that requires investigators to tell people what will happen if they get hurt in research. And so consent forms often have language that says something like, if you are injured as part of this research or if you are hurt as part of this research, um, we will take care of you for a short term, or we will transfer you to someplace else that will be able to take care of you, but your insurance company will, will pay for that. Or So we don't have a good system. And that's something that's been a, um, I think a, uh, it has been contentious because m most people who think about it for more than a few minutes think, that's a mistake. We ought to have a system in place for helping people who are hurt. And there's lots of literature on that if that's something of interest to you. Other questions? Well then, go forth and be ethical. <laughs> and remember we have a, if you're all intramural here, we have a department of bioethics which offers consults and classes and we have ethics grand rounds every four times a year. Some of them are great case-based uh, discussions, so please take advantage of us. And thank you for your attention.